Hey, Dylan, you did okay. Get my ears on in a second. You did okay, Dylan. On the test or the lab? Test. The test? Okay. All right. I'll check it. I go go check it now. I think you got an A. Oh, really? As I recall, yeah. Yes. <laughs> As I recall. Do you mind if I look at it? No, go ahead. Uh, we're going to stop share. Okay. Share screen. Uh, okay. That's not what I want. Why to? Okay. I don't know. That's fair. Okay. Where's it at? I'm in the wrong. I'm in the wrong. Dylan, I'm sorry. I'm in the wrong class. You're okay. Sorry. How's it going, guys? Yasmina, Vanessa, how's it going? Good. How are you? Doing good. How was the test, Yasmina? It was pretty easy, I think. Let's hope so. Let's hope so. I, I made a couple mistakes. I had to quick real qu uh, fix real quick. Uh, didn't affect you, Dylan. Uh, the first six people got a test that was a little bit I didn't define things as well as I should have. That was uh, the one question on the um, the orbital diagrams, which one was correct? Somebody got upset because I put the arrows were down and they should have been they, they felt they should have been up if they were the first ones to go in. Never mind. It's not important. I fixed it. Okay, how are we doing other than that, ladies and gentlemen? Pretty good. Pretty good. Okay, we got two more minutes or so. This, this lab is going to be very, very easy. It's going to be very, very easy for you to do. Has anybody looked at it yet? Looked at the results yet? Yeah. Yeah, I set up my lab already. It's basically... What, what I want you to grab from this is I want you to grab the whole theory behind chromatography, because if you ever go into any kind of chemistry again, you will be seeing this stuff again, because these instruments are throughout chemistry now. All right, that's the first thing. And the other thing is you need to know RF for the test, okay? You need to know RF for the final. And I'm just sitting here tap dancing. Um, Kevin, what happened to you on that last set, that last report? What? What happened to you on that last report? They had spectrophotometry one. Oh, I just it's I just com completely forgot. <laughs> do me a favor. Do me a favor. If necessary, email me or call me about about uh, about it because we need to get you back getting getting those 80 percent those 90 percent reports okay this one's a okay. very easy one make sure you do this one in, in time all right okay okay there's the magic hour all right we are going to i'm going to stop screen sharing and i'm going to get into the it's going to be very quick here, guys, because this is a fairly, fairly easy concept. Are you seeing the screen in front of you? Yeah. Okay. You guys have done this before. Have you ever taken like a coffee spill and taken a paper towel and dipped it into the coffee spill where the water kind of gets sucked up by the paper towel? Do you remember doing that at any time? Yeah. Never? Well, yeah. what happens is if you take that paper towel and you kind of like set it aside and let it dry, have you noticed that the very edge where the coffee went to, the very edge has kind of like a brown stain on it? 
Have you noticed that? No? Nope. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. That's exactly what we're doing tonight. What happens is the coffee wicks up the paper towel and it carries the brown liquid up the towel. If you, if different compounds get absorbed by the towel differently, they're gonna go up this towel at different rates. And that is all chromatography is. Early 1900s, which seems like when everything in chemistry developed, a Russian scientist named Mikhail Twisit, he used some diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth is nothing more than earth that's been purified to the point where it's white. He put this into a cylinder, much like uh, if you had like a big syringe, he put it in the cylinder and packed it down. Then what he did was he took some plants, just some regular ordinary plants, and he extracted them with some organic solvents. And he placed this extra extract near the bottom of the cylinder. And then he immersed the cylinder into a solvent. What happened was actually magic in his eyes. I don't think he even knew what was gonna happen. But what you had, doesn't this look like if you've seen a DNA, a DNA, uh, keep, uh, what are they, a barcode? Has anybody ever seen a DNA barcode? No. All right, same basic principle. What happens is the bottom here is where they're starting and you're letting the solvent go up. And so as the solvent is going up, some of these compounds cling to the diatomaceous earth. Other of the compounds are carried along with the solvent. So because different chemicals have different properties, they go up the cylinder at different rates. If you kind of like look at this compound, all the atoms of that compound have the same chemical properties. So they're gonna go up this column at the same rate, but it's gonna be at a different rate than ones in like this band. So he was absolutely fascinated that he got these different colors to appear in his extract. And that's actually where the term, I mean, if you ever hear like film Kodachrome, chrome is Latin for color. And it's the coloring of this compound that developed the name chromatography. Now, what actually is it? It's basically a separation or purification technique, which involves introducing a compound onto a stationary media, meaning it's bonded right there at the very beginning. Then we give that stationary media access to a mobile media, like putting the paper into a liquid depending upon the chemical bonds that the individual chemicals have, they will adhere to the paper more or less. If they adhere to the paper more than they wanna be dissolved in the solvent, then they're gonna travel up the paper slower. If they adhere to the liquid more than the solid, they're gonna go up rapidly. So that we're able to distinguish one compound from another. The job of the mobile phase is to force the mixture through the stationary phase. The job of the stationary phase is to prevent the mixture from moving. Does that kind of make sense to you guys? Yeah. Yes, sir. All right. Because the individual compounds have their own different chemical bonds, they adhere to the stationary phase at different rates. And there's actually little bonds that get broken and form. They bond to the stationary phase, then the mobile phase breaks it. Bond to the stationary phase, mobile phase breaks it. There is still a, an attraction between the stationary phase and the compound, but the mobile phase succeeds in breaking it for a little while 
and then it goes back onto the, the stationary phase. This alternating attraction dictates the time that the compound will travel through the stationary phase. Uh, I used to use an analogy. I used to use chromatography when I was on the, uh, uh, when I was doing forensic analysis. And the analogy I would use is, if I had a big long hallway that I lined with Velcro, and I threw a tennis ball and a baseball down this hallway at the same time, the tennis ball, because it's kind of fuzzy, will adhere to the sides of the hallway and travel through this hallway at a slower speed. The baseball, because it's smooth, proceeds faster. And that's really and truly all we're talking about it. Now, there are different chromatographies. And basically, when you define chromatography, you define it by the mobile phase and the stationary phase. Thin layer has a solid stationary phase. The mobile phase is a liquid. Gas liquid chromatography, which is the primary analytical tool that's used in forensics today. They combine a gas liquid chromatography with mass spectrometry. The gas liquid chromatography, the stationary phase is this liquid that coats over the top of these little beads or this liquid that coats the inside of a big long tube. The mobile phase is the gas. This tube is filled under a very high gas pressure. It's filled under a very high temperature. The combination of the two force the chemicals to go through this stationary phase. Another type of chromatography is high pressure liquid chromatography. Basically, it's used to purify water. And in which you have a stationary phase, which is gonna be purified earth, just like tweezit used. And the mobile phase is a liquid under very high pressure. Again, combination of the pressure and the solubility define which section the, uh, uh, will hold which particular compound. Now, we're using today paper chromatography. Our solid phase, our solid phase or our stationary phase is the paper. The mobile phase is the chemical solvent. So bottom line, when you're doing this experiment, the first thing you do is you measure a line about 1.5 centimeters from the bottom. And you use what's called a capillary tube, which is nothing more than a very, very thin tube that you're able to dip in the liquids. And as you take it out, you'll be able to put it, dab it onto the paper and the liquid from inside the tube will be deposited on the paper. Okay, so you put these spots that are about 1.5 centimeters in the bottom and you wanna separate them by about one centimeter apart from one another. So you spot every one of your known materials. Then you spot your unknowns into different slots on this paper. Then what you do is you take this paper, you curl it up and you put it inside a chamber that is covered on the top and it's filled with a solvent. The solvent is allowed to go up through the paper and as it goes up through the paper, it separates the known materials out. Now you let that elute. This is one of the most boring labs you ever will meet because you, after you spotted everything, you put this paper in there and you wait 50 minutes for this solvent to go as high as it'll go. Then what you do is you take the paper out and immediately where the solvent has moved to, you draw a line in pencil. Then you calculate the RF. RF stands for the retardation factor. You need to know this. 
You have to know this for the final, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't do anything else, memorize this formula. RF is the distance that your chemical moves. The RF is the distance that the chemical moves divided by the distance that the solvent moved. If I'm looking at a piece of paper and I'm looking at the green dot over here, I measure the green dot from the center and I measure what's called the origin where you started the spot off to where the spot ended up. That is the distance that my chemical moved. The distance the solvent moved is from the origin all the way up to that line you marked with the pencil. And RF is nothing more than the distance the spot moves divided by the distance the solvent moved. So if the solvent traveled 1.75 inches and the spot moved 1.19 inches, the RF is 1.19 divided by 1.75. Only calculation you need to do for this lab. Now, originally they thought, hey, it would be a good idea if we kept all these RFs that way, all we'd have to do is put the paper in, see how far it moved, and we would know what we have. Unfortunately, there are too many variables. For one thing, temperature has a lot to do whether something dissolves, when it dissolves in the mobile phase, dissolve in the solvent. Uh, concentration, when you are making your solution, you would have to make it exactly the same each and every time in order to be able to use this RF. So in actuality, it's not reliable to use this RF value to compare it. What you really have to do is, as I said earlier, you have to spot your known materials on the same paper as your unknown. You let both of them elude up. Then you have two things going in your favor. The one thing is, if your spot moves at the same rate as your unknown, then you know pretty much you have that particular known in your unknown. The other factor you have in your favor is the fact that we have coloring dyes. We're able to take this paper spray it with a dye and the different ions will spray different colors. Now, hopefully I'm going, I'm gonna stop this right here and hopefully I'm gonna to go to the, hopefully I'm gonna to go to the, I think they gave you a picture. Does anybody remember if they gave you a picture in the data? Guys, help me out here. Um, I'm not entirely no, sure. Not there. Thank you. Being not entirely certain is a good thing. Okay. Okay, they didn't do that. What they did was they just hand wrote it in. Okay. Now, this is the known material, the known ions that you have. Your unknown has some possibility of having silver, cobalt, copper, iron, or bismuth in it. These are the colors before staining. These are the colors after staining. Now, we've also measured the amount that the solvent moved on all the knowns and the distance the cation moved on all the knowns. What you are going to do is you are going to put your unknowns, your unknowns are put on the same, on the same paper as these guys. 
So all you're going to have to do is calculate the RFs for each one of these. And your unknown has three unknown cations in it. What you have to do is you have to look at these RFs, compare it to these. And once you do, you will have your, your unknowns identified. Pretty much a no-brainer, guys. Can anybody tell me what one of the ions you have in your unknown is? You don't even have to do the uh, math, guys. Yeah, bismuth. Bismuth, bismuth. Yeah, look. Solvent moved 10 in both, right? This one it moved 9.75. This one it moved 9.65. Isn't it a reasonable assumption that your unknown has bismuth in it? Yes, sir. What else do you have? Copper. And? Uh, I'm blanking on its full name, but C-O. Co cobalt. Cobalt. You probably have those three things in it. Ah. Uh, Pretty much, guys, that's all I have for you. Okie dokie. Anything you have for me? No, sir. Good enough. If it's all the same to you, I'm going to have an adult beverage now. I, I beat you to it. <laughs> Take care, guys, all right? Take it easy. You too, sir. Have a good evening. Okay, so you want to oh, go ahead.